Hello, everyone. This is another edition of Local Author Series. Today, I'm joined by Patricia Correll, and we will be discussing the unseen world. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you. All right. So let's start off with a bit about yourself. Just tell us who you are and things you'd like to do, um, things of that nature. Um, I'm Patricia, and I write mostly fantasy, a little bit of horror. Um, I've doubled in science fiction, but not a lot. So I kind of stick to the genres. Um, I'm originally from Kentucky. I've lived in Tuscaloosa for two years. I'm currently in my son's room because it has the best light, hence the Minecraft poster behind me. <laughs> Although I do enjoy Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I totally thought that was yours. But <laughs> <laughs> So you said you're from Kentucky and you moved to Tuscaloosa. Um, let's talk about your experience with uh, with Twig because that seems to be the story for a lot of writers in Twig. Um, they're they're not natives of Tuscaloosa, but they all moved here and they found that community. So let's talk about Twig and the importance of such organizations. Okay, um, I I was in a writers group back when I was in Kentucky and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very very beneficial. So as soon as I moved here, I started looking for one. Um, I finally came across Twig on Facebook and um, went to the first meeting, just showed up. Everybody was really welcoming. Um, They're incredibly supportive of the local author scene. And so, you know, meeting once a month, being able to read stuff, get feedback, and then just helping each other out, showing up to each other's signings and all of that stuff is incredible. The local author scene here is, is fantastic. So while interviewing, um different writers from Twig, they cover a lot of different genres. It's ranged from, so far, um, from historical fiction to a bit of um, nonfiction, but you are the first writer that I've interviewed that has dabbled in horror. So um, I believe that the best horror um, has roots in like real life is it basically grounded in real life. So let's talk about what scares you and what made you want to <laughs> delve into uh, horror. I'm not scared of much. Um, spiders, needles, big dogs, heights, whatever. None of that really bothers me. Um, <laughs> what kind of got to me was reading the Lovecraft mythos as a teenager. Um, and the idea that there is a power that is far greater than humanity that is out there in the cosmos and we don't know anything about it, but it knows about us. And it really doesn't care about us at all. Um, and there's one particular thing in my bio is that I'm terrified of the Mothman. And um, I read the Mothman prophecies. And the entire concept of the Mothman prophecies is that the Mothman, which was a creature that showed up in West Virginia in the 1960s, um, is actually an extra dimensional creature, somehow slipped out of its dimension into ours. And after that, men in black showed up and started interviewing witnesses. And it seemed like they were trying to find out how much they knew and what they had figured out about it. And so the idea that there's this entire other dimension of people who know about us, but we don't know anything about them is terrifying to me. And so I've written some Lovecraftian fiction um, just because that, that's a very interesting, compelling concept that there's things out there that we don't know about at all. Yeah, I think every town has its, its urban legend, and the Mothman is definitely one that would scare me. Uh, but, and if you um, ever get to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, there's a fantastic little museum called the World's Only Mothman Museum. Is that where the statue is located? The mm -hmm. big creepy yeah, statue? Yeah, okay. statue. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's worth the trip. <laughs> um, you also go into fantasy and folklore, uh, particularly that of the Japanese culture. So what made you interested in folklore, particularly of the Japanese culture? Um, I've always loved mythology and folklore. Um, I'm devoted to Joseph Campbell and his work. Um, and I, I think it appeals to me because you can see there are so many threads that are similar and vastly different cultures. Um, you know, almost every culture has some version of like the Cinderella story. Um, the hero's journey is really common to a lot of different, different stories from different cultures. Um, and at the same time, some of them are really strange. And I think I came to Japanese mythology the same way a lot of people do through anime. Um, when I was a teenager, my best friend introduced me to it. And I was really interested in the fantasy anime with all of the strange creatures that are, we don't have anything like them in Western culture. 
and um, I've included a lot of them in my work. So um, I have two novellas and a novel, and they are all based either on folk tales or within mythology from Japan. And when you write something like that, you have to do a lot of research because I spend an hour looking up crop cycles in Japan just to say like, you know, these people are harvesting this thing, but I needed to make sure that this time of year they would be harvesting this thing. So yeah, it's just a very interesting culture. A lot of my stuff is historical too. Um, and so they had a very alien way of thinking um, up until recently. One of the characters in one of my novellas is a samurai's daughter and their, their point of view and how they thought about things is really different from 21st century America. And so it's really interesting to try to get into that mindset to write these things. Glad to know that I'm not the only one whose introduction to a lot of um, fantasy, particularly of the Japanese culture, was through anime because <laughs> a lot of themes are your book. I was like, oh, I learned about this by watching Inuyasha. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so your latest work, The Unseen World, um, it contains fantasy elements, but it's still set in feudal Japan, which is a real place, of course. So talk a bit about the research that went into making this setting seem realistic. Okay, um, it's actually a secondary world fantasy based on feudal Japan. So it's not technically feudal Japan. Ah. Um, it's still very much rooted in a particular place in time. Um, you know, you just do a lot of reading and there's all kinds of books. Um, James Clavell's Shogun is a novel, but it has a lot of really good research and facts in it. Um, yeah, you just really need to read <laughs> to learn about something that's so different. The story is about a teenage girl who discovers that she's part of an Anmyoji clan, which she was not aware of. Um, the Anmyoji are a, a very particular Japanese concept. They're like sorcerers slash fortune tellers slash um, necromancers. They could do all kinds of things. And these were real people who actually existed in historical Japan. Um, in my version, this sort of more fantastic than what they probably could do. And in this particular scene, she is learning a, to be an Onmyoji with her clan, and she is confronting something called an artifact procession, which is another very particular Japanese concept. And um, so I thought it would be interesting to, to read this scene. All right, well, I'll cast it to the screen. Give me just one second. All right, and ready when you are. Okay. She untangled her legs from the blankets and rose, groping for her sash. Kirari settled onto her usual place on Tsunami's shoulder. Tsunami pulled on her new coat and crept to the door. She felt her way down the hall and into the front room. Then she went outside. The icy air seared her throat. Snow was piled along the garden walls, but the sky was clear, dotted with cold white stars. The moon was a silver sliver in the blackness. The enclave was so silent that Tsunami fancied she heard the slow, endless lash of the Nakayama's tail. Is something going to happen? Kirari snorted. Tsunami followed her yellow-eyed gaze. Orangish light flared above the far corner of the wall. It moved along the wall to the gate, which swung open to reveal two men, lanterns in hand. As they came closer, she recognized Genji. The other was a slender young man of 20 or so, a sleek falcon perched on his shoulder. He reminded Tsunami of someone, though she couldn't think who. Genji bowed. The other man did as well, but Tsunami didn't like his smile. It was slightly twisted, almost a smirk. How did you know to meet us here, cousin? Genji ushered her out of the gate. Kirari twisted her head all the way around to stare at the stranger. Kirari woke me up. I felt that I should come out here. You are as powerful as they say, Mistress Tsunami. The stranger came to her side. They started down the empty street, Tsunami flanked by the men. She is indeed. Genji seemed unaware of the mockery in the other's tone. Cousin, this is Sasugawa Shoku. You know his brother. His brother? Tsunami examined the man. The shape of his face, his chin. You're Shinryu's brother? He inclined his head. I'm honored you recognize me, mistress. This is my spirit messenger, Keiichi. Genji smiled at Shoku, but his eyes were hard. He didn't like Shoku either, Tsunami realized. Soma sat up on Genji's shoulder, looking about with bright, awake eyes for once. You're going to see something extraordinary tonight, Tsunami, an artifact procession. Artifact procession? Shoku interrupted Genji's reply. You do understand that all things have a spirit, even man-made objects, don't you? Of course, not only on Miyoji learn that. The longer an object is kept and used and loved, the stronger its spirit grows. Some very old things even develop feelings. When they're discarded, they become angry. Genji smiled reassuringly. An artifact procession is said to be more amusing than anything, but there is some danger involved. Do you have your ward? 
She nodded, glad she thought to fold the yellow slip of paper into her sash. Lord Kazumasa will give us other spells when we get there. In order to banish the object spirits to the unseen world, we'll have to walk among them. The new spells will make us invisible to them. They were passing through the pasture land. Tsunami nodded to the invisible Nakayama. The men ignored it as they entered the city. People throw away things all the time, she mused. If all discarded objects get angry, why aren't there furious artifact spirits everywhere? As Shoku said, the spirit of a man-made object is weak. Only when many of them are gathered together do they have the strength to break the barrier between the worlds. In this case, we asked questions around town and found that an old man died several weeks ago. He collected antique furniture and hoarded it like a crow. After he died, his family hauled the pieces they didn't want to the trash yard. The spirits have been feeding on their shared rage, growing stronger. They'll probably move tonight. Move? Try to return to their old home. Make call it an artifact procession. Genji swung the lantern, casting dancing shadows on the walls to either side. I've never seen one, so I'm excited. But I'm a poor on Miyoji tsunami, so you may have to rescue me from a rampaging bathtub. They walked through the dark streets of Phoenix City for a long time. It was eerily quiet. Sometimes Tsunami saw a cloud of colored light and heard laughter from another street, but the Onmyoji avoided, avoided the tea houses that must have been there. Tsunami remembered her chilly reception in the city with Misa weeks before. She supposed the sight of three Onmyoji and their spirit messengers might send people into a panic. The sense of something unnatural in the city grew with every step they took. Tsunami's skin sprouted goose flesh, and the hair on her neck rose. Kiwari swung her yellow eyes from side to side, watching. Genji halted. We're nearly there. Shoku, can you run ahead? Find Lord Kazumasa and ask if it's safe to come near. Shoku detached himself from Tsunami's side with evident relief. Of course. He and Keiichi jogged down the road and into an alley. Genji pulled Tsunami to the nearest wall, a small but neat house, and leaned against it. Tsunami remained standing in the street. Shoku doesn't like me. Genji set the lantern on the ground. He's jealous of you. Do many of the Anmyoji share his feelings? He hesitated. A few, perhaps. Weak ones. But then, I'm weak, and I like you. Tsunami knew he was trying to make her laugh. She managed to smile. The artifact's power was pressing harder, waking a slight pain behind her eyes. Soma sat up, balancing on his wing claws. After a moment, Shoku materialized at the mouth of the alley. My lord says to hurry. A faint glow hovered above the building several streets away. A minute of jogging brought them to a wide thoroughfare. The street was lined with blank walls higher than Tsunami's head, with gates allowing access to the gardens and houses behind. Lanterns were placed at regular intervals along the street. Anmyoji stood between them. Tsunami recognized most of the faces, though she knew few of their names. Lord Kazumasa placed, paced the center of the road. When he caught sight of them, he beckoned them over. You're just in time. He held out three rectangles of red paper, covered in writing. In the flickering light, Tsunami made out the character for Deceive. The trash yard lies at the end of the street. Shiban has been hearing movement from that direction for some time. Place these on your robes. Genji, go to the trash yard entrance. Tsunami, Shoku, you two take your places in those empty spots. He gestured to two spaces between lanterns, across from each other. I will disguise myself as one of them and take the lead of the procession. Tsunami saw he held a slip of paper with slightly different characters, stuck fast to the front of his robe. They'll think I'm taking them to their old home, but I'll lead them in a circle, back to the trash yard. They will believe they are home and be content to stay there. All you must do is walk alongside the procession. If one of the artifacts begins to stray, bring it back. But how, Tsunami began. Lord Kazumasa had already turned away. Shiban sat up and clicked her beak warningly. Kiwari and Keiichi did the same. All along the street, the spirit messengers warned their masters. The air echoed with the sharp clicking of beaks. Call one of the others if you need help. Shoku smirked. She glared at him as they both moved to their assigned places. The assembled on Miyoji stared intently toward the darkness-shrouded trash yard. From a few muttered exchanges, Tsunami learned that only the oldest among the Sasagawa had ever seen an artifact procession. Even Lord Kasamasa had never encountered one before this. He was only following instructions set down in the family records. It's all right, Tsunami thought. I'll just focus on the back of the man in front of me. Lord Kazumasa can handle the rest. That comforting thought was forced away when the noise began. It was faint at first, in a rhythmic clomping like a clumsy horse. But more and more horses seemed to be joining the herd. The air rang with the rough clatter of what? The other on Miyoji were still a stone, their gazes fixed, jaws tight. Tsunami sneaked a peek at Shoku. He held his head high. She narrowed her eyes, bit down hard on her lip, and tried her best to stand as straight as he did. The noise grew louder. After what seemed a very long time, Lord Kazumasa appeared, at first a shadow in the weak light, then gradually coming into focus. He looked neither right nor left, but stared straight ahead. Shiban sat backward on his shoulder, watching the procession that followed. The first piece was a low table, ancient and ornate. The scars on its dark wood stood out in the lantern light. Its stumpy legs were carved into animal paws. 
and moved by rocking back and forth, its heavy legs crashing to the dirt road. Behind it came an antique trunk with tarnished clasps, clasps its rope handles rotted away. It hopped like a huge misformed rabbit. Next was a coat hanger with three legs, a dresser whose drawers jounced in and out with every movement, a cooking pot rolling on its side. Tsunami gaped until her mouth was dry, but she forced herself to stand still. Across the street, Shoku's dignity had fallen away. His expression mirrored hers. She was frightened, but fear was dulled by excitement. Almost nobody had ever seen an artifact procession, but she was this very moment watching one. The Anmyoji nearest the trash yard had assumed their positions next to the procession first. The parade seemed endless. The old man's house must have truly been stuffed. But finally, the Anmyoji in front of Tsunami turned and joined his assigned piece, a desk scored with old knife marks. Misgiving suddenly lodged in Tsunami's throat. She swallowed hard, but the lump remained. Shoku was returning to flank their piece, a mirror in a thick frame of rainy wood. He did it casually, as if escorting unruly mirrors was an everyday duty. Tsunami swung around, she wouldn't let him see her hesitate, and began to walk. The clatter and clomp of the procession drowned out any other sound. There were no people on the streets. The noise alone would be enough to keep anyone inside. Tsunami couldn't blame them for hiding. She wondered if Genji still thought artifact processions were amusing. The mirror made a slow rocking progress, so it was easy for Tsunami to keep up. Its dirty silver face caught the lantern light and reflected it. When they turned a corner onto an unlit street, it snagged the pale white glow of the stars, dimly lighting its own path. Kiwari eyed the mirror with regal suspicion. The unlit street was very long. They paraded down it without incident, and Tsunami allowed herself to relax a little. The mirror seemed docile enough. Tsunami let her mind wander as she walked. She'd never seen this part of the city before. They turned a corner occupied by a shrine to the dog god. Tsunami turned her head to look at the shadowed statues of dragon dogs that guarded the door. Kiwari bit Tsunami's earlobe. Tsunami hissed at the pinch and returned her attention to the mirror. All right, Kira. Her exclamation faded into a horrified gasp. For as she looked back at the mirror, something red and rectangular fluttered past the mirror's silver face and disappeared under Shoku's sandals. Frantically, she patted the front of her robe, but the spell that guaranteed her invisibility to the artifact spirits was gone. Tsunami looked up to see the mirror lurching toward her. She had time for a single yelp before the corner of the frame buried itself in her stomach, snatching away her breath. Tsunami doubled over, clutching her abdomen. The mirror rocked awkwardly in the other direction, then back toward her. She had a quick glimpse of movement from the other side of the procession. As the mirror came closer, her mind was suddenly filled with an image of the character she'd learned that morning, the one that repelled violence. Across from her, Shoku was lifted off the ground, one arm still raised. His surprised expression was almost comical as he was flung backward, striking the wall of the opposite building. Keiichi flew up as Shoku crumpled to the ground in a heap of white and black. The mirror tottered, righted itself, and continued its march. Tsunami struggled to her feet, gasping in shock. The Anmyoji behind her had caught up. She cried, will you watch my mirror? Without waiting for an answer, she ran down the length of the procession, not daring to cross it. The old man's collection seemed endless, dressers, writing tables, bookcases, even the wooden tub Genji had joked about. The Anmyoji stared at her as she ran past, but none left their posts to follow. She finally came to the end of the line, a limp sleeping mat that lagged a little behind the others. Three Anmyoji brought up the rear of the procession. To Tsunami's relief, one of them was Genji. He caught sight of her and stopped in his tracks. Cousin? Shoku's hurt, she gasped over her shoulder. Under the curious and mildly alarmed gazes of the other two men, Genji left his place to run after her. What happened? He asked as they dashed past the new line of puzzled on Miyoji. I don't know. The mirror attacked me. Shoku tried to help. The words spilled clarity into her mind. Shoku had tried to help her. He was crumpled against the wall where he'd fallen. Keiichi perched on the rim of a nearby rain barrel. He hissed at Tsunami and spread his wings as if to leap at her, but a growl from Kirari stopped him. He tucked his wings in sullenly. Poor Keiichi. Tsunami tried to comfort him. He'll be all right. Genji knelt over Shoku, pressing two fingers to his neck. He's alive. Help me turn him over. She took Shoku's shoulders. His flesh was cold, so cold it seeped through his robe and numbed her fingers. Shoku's eyes were pinched closed, his face horribly, horribly pale. A cut on his temple trickled blood into his hair. Tsunami pressed the heel of her hand into the wound to stop the bleeding. Why is he so cold? Genji didn't look at her. Tsunami, tell me exactly what happened. A mirror attacked you? Yes, I, I lost my concentration for a moment, and my spell, the red one, fell off. Ashamed, she twisted the hem of Shoku's sleeve between her fingers. The mirror saw me and attacked, but Shoku, he tried to stop it. She scrubbed her eyes with her sleeve, trying to prevent the tears she felt coming. Nothing else? What did you do? Me? I, I screamed when the mirror hit me, and I guess I panicked because I thought of the inverse spell Lord Kazumasa taught me this morning, and then Shoku fell. Genji got to his feet. Stay here. We need help to get him back to the Enclave. Tsunami nodded dumbly. Alone, she stroked Shoku's icy hand. 
Keiichi continued to watch her from his perch on the barrel. It's all right, don't worry, he'll be fine. But her trembling voice belied her words. Kirari, stop glaring at Keiichi like that. The night grew colder as she waited. Tsunami took off her coat and tucked it around Shoku's prone body. Quietly, she muttered prayers to Lord Enjo, the god of death, to spare him. Genji finally returned with two other onmyoji. They stared curiously at Tsunami, but she couldn't bring herself to meet their gazes. Take him to the healer, Genji instructed. I'll take Mistress Tsunami home and meet you there. We should tell Lord Kazumasa, one of the onmyoji said. The other had taken a slip of paper from his sleeve and was tracing a character on it with his finger. The character appeared in thick black lines. The onmyoji muttered an incantation and laid the paper on Shoku's chest. Shoku's body began to rise, rigid as a board. Tsunami's coat drooped off his shoulders. Keiichi hopped from the barrel to his master's arm, clucking softly. The damage isn't bad, but Genji sounded uncertain. And Lord Kazumasa will be tired. We can inform him in the morning. The onmyoji shrugged. They took Shoku away, one of them pushing gently at the soles of his sandals, the other holding Shoku's free arm to guide the floating body through the streets. Tsunami shivered. She left her coat lying over Shoku, but it seemed wrong to take it back. I don't want to go home. I want to go with Shoku. The healer will take care of him. Besides, you'd be in the way. Genji took her arm with a distracted air. He didn't seem to notice she was coatless. Cousin, you don't like Shoku, do you? No, he doesn't like me. At least I thought he didn't. I hope he's all right. Yes, Genji replied absently. I believe you didn't mean it. Tsunami started. Mean what? We'll talk tomorrow. He left her at the door of her father's house. Shoulders sagging, Tsunami crept inside and spent the rest of the night huddled beneath a mound of blankets while Kiwari watched over her from her perch. Thank you for reading that. Um, I started reading um, The Unseen World recently, and it has all the things I like, elements of fantasy. Um, it introduces the stakes relatively early in the story, so instantly you're drawn into the story and you know um, and you know what the stakes are, and you know what's about to happen. So I'm really enjoying this. So for those who would like to read more of The Unseen World, where can they pick this book up? Uh, it is available as an ebook or a paperback on Amazon. Um, you can also pick it up as a paperback at Ernest and Hadley, um, a wonderful little indie bookseller. And um, yeah, if you see me out and around, feel free to ask because I might have a copy on me. <laughs> Thank you for providing the copy that will now be the copy for the Tuscaloosa Public Library. <laughs> yeah, you can get it at the library soon too. Um, I also so have several, you... uh, novellas and short stories, which are also available on Amazon as well. So, so on your Goodreads page, um, I saw a oh, a quote that was pretty interesting. You state that all you state that you believe all humans are natural storytellers. So, what advice would you give to a prospective writer attempting to find their voice? Right, there's an amazing TED talk, and I cannot remember the name of the person. He was an anthropologist, and his TED talk was about the speculation that the reason that humans are the dominant species on the planet are because we are the only species that conveys information that is not a biological or physical reality. We are the only species that we know of that tells stories. And this is what has caused us to become the dominant species on the planet. So I think everybody in whatever way is a storyteller. Um, and anybody who is interested in started writing, you don't sit around and wait for the muse or inspiration or whatever to strike because it's not gonna happen. To write, you need to sit down and start writing. And it's going to be bad. I was so bad when I first started writing. I am embarrassed. But the more you work, the better you will get. And we're always getting better at what we do. So don't be discouraged if you start out and you don't like what you're writing. Um, don't sit around and wait for the muse. Just sit down, get a pen and paper, get your computer, whatever you do, and just start doing it. Don't wait. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. Also, um, if you are interested in writing, um, you can also, you can also link up with great groups such as Twig. Um, I know Twig currently is a meeting right now, but Twig is another source, um, another resource for you here locally. But um, just Patricia, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Is there anything you want to say in closing? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I love that this community is so supportive of the indie local authors. Um, people tend to think that authors are these mystical creatures that live in big mansions like Stephen King, but really they're your neighbors. So <laughs> we really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem. I'm glad to do this. Well, until next time. Goodbye. Bye.